join your church? Can Jesus join the church? Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, as he comes into the city, verse 10 says, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Number one, they may not be familiar. They may not be familiar. There are times, Sister Washington, where we feel like people ought to come to church and they ought to know everything that we know. They ought to know how to sing. They ought to know when to stand up. They ought to know when to sit down. They ought to know the proper language and etiquette. They ought to dress a certain way, so on and so forth. And the fact is, just because you know Jesus does not mean they know him. There are times where we try to impose our thinking and our way on everybody else. When in fact, they may not know and understand the same things that we know and understand. And so many of us come from traditions whereby we grew up in church and so on and so forth. But then there are some of us who may not really have a clue and understanding of not only the church, but certain kinds of churches and denominations and so on and so forth. And so the fact is, when Jesus came in Jerusalem, they didn't even, they were asking, who is this? The fact is, today, that's what the world is asking you. That's what the world is asking us. That's what the world is asking the church. Sister Lynn, the world is asking us, who is Jesus? The question is, how does the church respond? How do we respond to who this Jesus is? They may not know him. We claim to know him, but sometimes our attitude does not show that we truly, honestly know him. And so as they came in town, they didn't know him. And we must recognize that if we really want the spirit of Christ to come into our church, that we must recognize that everybody's not always going to be familiar with our tradition. Not only that, as he came in, the multitude in verse 11 said, uh, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now the crowd knew something, but they didn't know the whole story. So sometimes the crowd may know some bits and pieces, but Sister Mom Fisher, they may not know the whole story. See, there are some people that I watch on news on the TV, and especially Brother Rocky on that Fox News, they know some things about Jesus, but it seems like they don't know the whole story. See, I've heard some people talk about Jesus. They spell his name. They know that the Bible exists and all those kind of things. But when you get down to the true spirit of what Christ really stood for, there's some folk that may not know the whole story. Oh yeah, he was born in a manger and he came from this city and he did this and he did that. But do you really know him? I love the song in the church, Sister Jackie Hodges said that you know I've got a song that the angels can't sing. See, there are some people that might know his name, but then there are other people who know that, that, that he has been with them when they didn't love themselves. He loved them. There are some people that know that he's provided food on that table, shelter over their head, water in the first night. There are some people that know his name, and then there are some people that know him in an intimate relationship. And so the crowd may not always know the whole story. There are a lot of crowds around who claim to know certain things, and they're fad religions and fad churches and so on and so forth. Just because there's a crowd does not mean that they know the whole story. Then look at verse 12, what happens when he comes into the temple. He cast them all out that sold and bought in the temple, and he overthrew the table of the money changers and the seats of them that sold them. Let me tell you, sometimes he might come to agitate your system. He might come to agitate your system. Sometimes we think that uh, the, the Lord was going to do it our way. Oftentimes, the Lord will come and agitate your system. Because if your system was so good, it would work all the time. But think about it, most of the time, our system doesn't even work. And so what happens is oftentimes in the church, we want to dictate to God how God ought to do his business. We want to dictate what kind of members can be a part of our church. But us is don't want them folk in our church. They're not like us. They don't speak like us. They're not educated like us. They don't look like us. They're not our same race. When I was growing up, uh, we never heard a white minister in our church. It's the truth. The whole time I was growing up, I never saw a white minister come preach in our church. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, there's something wrong with that. 
Something wrong with a, a world whereby whites and blacks live together and we don't come together in worship. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with it on both sides. You know, uh, uh, black folk can sit up and call it the black church and be racist if you want to. You got your dashik yelling with your hand in the air talking about, you know, black is proud and I know Jesus would approve. No, he would not. Because the fact is, he died for all. He died no matter what race you are. And so it might overthrow your system. People get upset at certain things. I think you remember when Pastor Bill first came here, uh, it seemed like there was at least one or two people who had, had their self on their shoulders. And we very quickly told them, say, you might go going down, going down the street, either way you find a black church. But this is not a black church. This is not a white church. This is a church. And we worship together. It has nothing to do about the race of the person. And so oftentimes people get caught up in those kinds of things. And I tell you that uh, I believe that God is severely displeased. That here we are in 2013, about to go into 2014, and we still have these black clubs that we call churches. And then I get invited to ministers' meetings. And you go to the ministers' meeting. I belong to one group that I, I later got out of. And uh, I brought some white friends with me, and they told me, they said, we're not ready for white folks in our association. And I say that because I know that uh, a lot of times we feel like, oh, it's them. No. Sometimes we keep mess going. You know, either you forgive, you forget, and you move on, or you're going to keep on in that cancer. And you allow it to eat at you. God wants us to worship. And he wants us to worship together. Amen. And he wants us to understand together. I know that uh, some of the ministers asked me when we first hired uh, Yo-Yo and Felix. When we hired Felix, some of the ministers asked me, said, how is that working? How, how does a black church have an Asian musician? I said, well, that one's not a black church. <laughs> That's the first thing you got to get out your mind. We've got Hispanic families and white families and black families. On many Sundays anymore, I think the white folks outnumber the black ones anymore. <laughs> However, it doesn't matter. The fact is, we all worship together. And how it's supposed to work, if we're really going to make it to glory, is to recognize that often our feelings and our thoughts about what church should be. The other thing is, church is not just filled with rich people. And I see that on the television. They say that, well, the sign of Christianity is wealth. That's just about as foolish as those folk who think that you have to speak in tongues to be saved. My salvation is not predicated upon me speaking in tongues. It is not predicated upon me being rich. It is not based upon how many scriptures I can recite. I am saved because Jesus died. God did not leave it up to me. He let his son come and die. He bled. And that is what purchased our salvation. All I had to do is accept and believe. Because Jesus did the rest. And so your system might be agitated if you would allow Jesus to join your church. But not only that, in verse 13, he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a dinner feed. Let me tell you that Jesus calls for prayer and not prophets. And I mean prophets as in money. He calls for prayer and not prophets. Didn't I just finish telling you that Liberty Hill has lived dangerously upon the edge of finances? Because we recognize that we didn't need to have a whole bunch of money in the bank. But we needed to make certain that good ministry was taking place. Do you know throughout this year I very, could, very easily could have said, number one, stop sending money to China. Number one, I could have gone back to that old racist idea that, well, now, number one, we black folk, we ought to be given to Africa. I've been saying to, to us, no, we need to give money all over the world. Yeah. This whole year, we've been giving money to missions in China. Now, people we know, it's not just somebody just taking our money. I mean, the wolves have been here. We know them. 
They came from our community. They've gone to China. They're doing ministry there. We are supporting it. And so we very easily could have said, well, that doesn't fit into the budget. Since Lisa could have said, Pastor, you're losing your mind. We ought not be giving money to them every month. We need that money. No, we didn't. We could have very easily went up on the other church that we support. We could have told them, said, look, you got a building and, and we need to charge you extra. Instead of charging extra, we took a loss. And we knew we were taking the loss when we went into the deal. We said, we'll pay this, we'll pay this, and by the way, we'll pay this too. That's ministry. We could have said, Pastor Bill, look, you got to come up with some money up front, in the middle, and at the end. <laughs> no. Bill came to me and he said, well, we got to give you something. I said, we don't even know how to take your money. We don't have a system for it. Our church has continued to do ministry. And there were things at times where it seemed like, well, maybe we shouldn't. We said, no, we got to keep doing ministry. And we've used our finances to do that. We've used our finances to help. I will tell you that in the midst of, I tell it now that it's over. But when we were in the month of October this year, really there were some other things that I thought would have been good for the church. One of those things that Brother Simons continued to point out to me is that if you remember I told you early on we needed to rip out that carpet. Put tile in. I could have been standing here peddling money for the tiles every Sunday. I need money to, to rip the carpet out. I need money to rip the carpet out. I didn't ask you, I didn't keep asking you for money to rip the carpet out. I came and said, let's give to the Gideons. And I told you we wouldn't give until we got, we wouldn't stop until we got to the right amount. And we got to the right amount, we gave to the Gideons. My point is this. There will be times in our church and in the life of this church whereby you look around and it might be a ceiling tile falling. We try to do our very best. But don't get upset if it doesn't get done right away because our first priority is to make sure that the ministry that God has led us in is done first and yeah. foremost. Yeah. It is not about this building. The Lord gave us this building. We didn't ask for this building. We didn't go out searching for this building. We didn't go in a whole bunch of debt trying to buy this building. The Lord gave us this building. So if the Lord gave it to us, what do you think he's going to do? And so we will continue to do ministry as the Lord leads us to, even in those moments when it becomes tight. I'm crazy enough to say, keep on giving to Bob's, keep on giving to the Gideons, keep on giving to Kiva, keep on giving to the Water Project, keep on doing for somebody else. And the Lord will continue to bless this church. Because it is not about profits, it is about prayer. I'm not trying to wait for you to have some surplus so you can buy me a jet and a plane and a Mercedes Benz and a, and a new tailor-made suit. Because ministry can be done in big overhauls. Ministry can be done as the pastor drive pickup truck or whatever kind of truck they give you. And y'all know I drove that pickup truck to the Lord said that uh, with man, I tell you, when he says zero down and sign, and I said, let me go find out if that's the truth. I said, I never drove a Volkswagen. And the man, man come out there talking about, do you need the test drive? We bought three around. I said, no. <laughs> I said that, Sister Vicki Williams, because you ever had somebody give you something and you wonder what they're supposed to be giving it to you? <laughs> Don't you get to the door as quick as you can? <laughs> he said, I bought three around for you to test drive. I don't need to touch that. Which one are you going to give me? <laughs> I'm still looking at it like, you really going to give me this car? <laughs> Which one are you going to give me? He said, sir, you sure you don't? I said, no, I'm going to hurt me. <laughs> Shoot, he pulled that car and I got in that car and drove off. I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you don't need a new nothing. You don't need that and this and that. That's not what I'm waiting on. Our church has to do ministry first. And the Lord will continue to bless us in that. I found out something this year that even increased my faith even a little bit more. As I was saying to somebody, I went back in the finance room one day, and I was looking for something, and I kept on noticing that there was pieces of paper stuck on all these envelopes. And so I 
I started looking at these envelopes and I noticed that our finance secretary and our treasurer, when the bills come in, they start writing scriptures on the outside <laughs> and praying over the bills. And, and I said, the Lord really works to have people who yeah. are dedicated to yeah. God in that way. And so we must recognize that it is about prayer and not about profit. Prayer means, Sister Ruffin, that our faith is increased. Yeah. We're not concerned about whether or not there is a profit because the profit, the money over and above, who needs it? Profit is for greedy people. See, I don't need to put up any leftovers. I just need to eat today. And I need to be assured that he's going to feed me tomorrow. I said to Sister Lisa some time ago, I said, you know, if we went over to Red Lobsters with no money in our pocket and ordered up the biggest meal and didn't know how we were going to pay for it, finish the meal, and the waitress comes and says, your bill has been taken care of. Well, who took care of it? Somebody saw you in the restaurant and took care of the bill for you. Well, I would say thank you and leave. Now, the Lord send me somewhere else the next day. I'd say thank you and leave. Some of us would complain, well, Lord, why didn't you tell me ahead of time how that was going to work? <laughs> I said, to some, I said some, to some mother, because everybody wouldn't understand, you got to really be a mother that can cook. You need to be one of them down south mothers, uh, <laughs> one of them down south mothers with the big biscuit heels, you know, that can really cook. If you cooked, if big mama done cooked, and she cooked a great meal. I mean, this, this food is good, Brother Turner. And she's got her children coming in. She tells them it's dinner time. And one of her kids gets up in the cabinet and pulls out a Tupperware dish and comes back to the table and begins to put food into the Tupperware dish. And the mother says to the child, what are you doing? And the child says, Mom, don't worry, I'm going to eat. I'm just putting away some for tomorrow in case you choose not to feed me. Mm. Wow. Now give that some thought and think about how we often treat God. I've got to put away some. I've got to fend for myself. Lord, I recognize these resources came today, but you might not provide for me tomorrow. God is a provider for us each and every day. You don't need Tupperware dishes in the presence of the king. Do you really think that, that, that Prince William or, or Prince Harry or, or any of the princes over in England really care about how much food is in the cupboard? Do you think that they go down there and count the cans of green beans? No, because they live in the kingdom. Their mother is the queen. And so they figure, we're going to get fed every day. You think Sasha and Malia are in the White House trying to figure out how many pop tarts are left in the box? <laughs> well, if God is truly our king, then why are we counting the pop tarts in the box? If God got you, then God got you. And so there's a house of prayer and not prophet. But 14 says, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. This past two years, and I'm not talking about, if you are a new member in this church, I'm not talking about you. But we had some strange folk come through here every now and then. <laughs> they different than us. And, you know, it, it, it'll catch you by surprise and say, wow, look at what God is doing. The way that he's diversified our church. When you begin to accept Christ into the church, yeah. then you will recognize that he attracts needy people. Yeah. Yeah. I never wanted to pastor a church where everybody else's members can't join our church. Because usually when everybody else's folk come here, the same hell they was over there is the same hell they are over here. They got mad over there, they be mad over here. I have come to the conclusion that there 
are a few folk that, you know, they change because they're in a different community, in a different environment. There are a few folk who possibly chose the wrong church to start with, and they realize that they weren't getting fed there, and they come, and they want to be a part of living here. But notice that when people come, they come because there is a need. They don't come because they decide to come here just to show off. Liberty Hill is not that kind of church. People that connect with this church are people who are ready to be what God has called them to be. I've often told people that uh, this is not Walmart. Liberty Hill is not Walmart. And what I mean by Walmart is I mean it's if Walmart is a big department store, you get everything, you just keep on searching, you find it. Liberty Hill is very specialized in who we are. We used to apologize for that. Say, well, you know what, we're so sorry that we don't have that for you, and we're so sorry that we don't have this for you. And then one day the Lord stopped me and said, you know what, I've given you what you're supposed to have. This is a word church first. Everything else has to fall into place. It is a word church first. That's what, that's what we do first. We open our Bibles. Look around the church right now. See the Bibles? See the pens? See the writing? Sister Paul said that, writing everything there. Recording. Sister Wood said that, recording. This church is full of recording secretaries. Don't do them with writing. Everything you see, they're writing it down. They got the Bibles out. Why? Because we don't just believe anything somebody tell us. And I've said to you, even though I'm the pastor, don't even trust that. Write it down. Read your Bible. Study it. Walk in your word because you know what? Your word is what's going to carry you through. Yeah. I've been to a whole bunch of shouting churches, good shouting churches. Boy, they got good music. Folk dance all around. Meet them in the parking lot after church. More hell than a little bit. They talking about the pastor, the preacher, the mother, the everybody. And what I found here at Liberty Hill as I've enjoyed pastoring this church is I find people who seem to love one another and love God. I don't see all that cussing each other out and fussing and talking about folks and all that. I don't see that. I see a church that loves each other. And so this is a church that decided that we would follow Jesus. And when you follow Jesus, sometimes needy people will come also. Some churches don't want those needy people. Now when I say needy, sometimes we think that they're needy financially. But let me tell you that there are so many other needs in the world. There are people who have been hurt. There are people who are suffering from mental abuse. There are people who are suffering from physical abuse. There are people in our world who have been sexually mistreated and they're suffering. And they're in need of love. The question is, when they come to this church, are we able to meet their need with love? I've said to you any number of times, when people come through the door, they need something. And the question is, are we willing to be humble enough to say that we will love you and we offer Christ to you? I might not have a good voice. I might not have silver and gold. But what I have, this relationship with God, this love that he has given me, I'm willing to give you. And so as you look at verse 15, you'll realize that the chief priests and the scribes, they saw the wonderful things that he did. The children crying in the temple, and they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. But then they were displeased about it. And so you must recognize that everybody may not like his kind of wonderful. There are people who like their kind of wonderful, but not his kind of wonderful. I said, I read an article that said that the worst birthday ever would have to be Christmas. If Jesus was to come to Columbus on Christmas Day to look around and see so many people giving everybody a gift but him. 
Somebody said, well, how do I give a gift to Jesus? Well, Michaela, I'm glad you asked. In Matthew chapter 25, he says that when you've done it for the least of them, you've done it for me. When, when, when you give to people who have everything, you still haven't really reached him. Because he says when you did it to the least of them, when you feed the hungry, when you give water to the thirsty, when you visit those in prison, when you visit those in hospital, those who are sick, when you've done it for the least of them, then you've done it for me. I hope that by this time next year, that the rest of us will be saying, let me get out there to Bethlehem on Broad Street. Because I've got some people to feed. Somebody asked me, said, well, why don't we do Bethlehem on Broad Street on Refugee? Why don't we feed people here on Refugee? And I said to them, because I believe that the church still has so much power when we all come together. They are in a neighborhood downtown where homeless people reside in large numbers. And so it makes sense for us to go down there and help them. Now, what you don't see is you don't see Liberty Hill's name here and there and plastered all over the place. I know that it's on some of the websites and that kind of thing. But the fact is, we don't do it because of our name. We don't do it because of our name. And we don't need to do it because of our name either. We have a 10 foot by 20 foot sign out front with nothing but our name on it. How more selfish could we get? We don't need to put our name out there. Go around Columbus. You talk to people and you say, well, people ask me, say, what church do you go to? I go to Liberty Hill Baptist Church. That's a church with that big sign out on the east side. I've passed there before. And so everybody knows our name. We don't need to put our name out there. What we need to make sure that we're always putting out there is our Savior. Yeah. We need to continue to do for others as we would have the Lord to do for us. But then look at verse 16. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and suckling thou hast perfected praise. If you want Jesus to be a part of your church, you've got to recognize that sometimes his ways may not be familiar. The crowd may not know the whole story. He may agitate your system. He will call for prayers and not profit. He will attract the needy. You may not like his kind of wonderful, but then you'll recognize that the unlikely will be encouraged. The unlikely will be encouraged. Sometimes the very folk that we think are going to get it are the folks that won't. My aunt used to tell a joke. I don't even remember how it all went, but it was some type of surprise in heaven. And one of the surprises that she said that you would have when you got there is that you were there. And she said the other surprise that you would have when you get there is that she was there. Sometimes we think the, the very people who we think are the super saints, are the worst of the lot. And some of the folks that we think couldn't make it into heaven no kind of way, those are the folk with the hearts of pure gold. Jesus died not for just one, but he died for all. He died for us while we were yet sinners. He loved us. Can I help you with that? If he loved us while we were yet sinners, then that means no matter what our sin might have been, he loved us while we were yet sinners. So we in the church, we might point our fingers and try to decide who is the chief of the sinners. You, you know, my sin isn't so bad because I'm just a liar. She's a thief. Or, or my sin isn't so bad because I'm just a thief and they are sexually promiscuous. You know, my sin isn't so bad. I just sleep around every now and then. They are, are substance abusers. But let me tell you that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Well, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet still on the bar floor, while we were yet hanging over the toilet with our hangover, he died for us. Can you believe that he died for the homosexual? He died for the for the for the unwed mother. 
others. He died for those who lie. He died for those who cheat. He died for whoever you think is the bad person in the room. He died for all of us. And so it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter whether you're white or black. It doesn't matter whether you're Chinese or Mexican. God still loves us all. He loves us tall. He loves us short. He loves us round. He loves us skinny. He loved all of us and he died for us. While you were yet a sinner, he died for you. And so can Jesus join the church? I dare you say no. Because if he can't jump, then what right do you have to be here? Because if they tell the sinner to leave the church today, then there'd be nothing left in this room but pews and carpet. Because if all of us had to leave that were sinners, I'd have to leave first. And the ushers would be right behind me. The choir would be behind that. The deacons, the trustees, all of us would have to file out of here like it was a fire drill. Because God has died for the sinner and all of us have come short of the glory of God. Now, does that mean we ought to stay there? No. For grace is not a license to sin. But grace is so all the grace of God is given that we might continue on the journey and that each and every day we ought be moving closer to who Christ is. And someday, as my good friend Dr. Gardner Taylor used to say, someday when the end has finally come, the trump of God shall sound and all of us shall be gathered together in the heavens. The angels ought to look and they ought to see the, the, the one who created us. And they ought to look at the son that has been given, the son Jesus. They ought to look at Jesus. And they ought to look at us. And they ought not be able to tell the difference. And so we ought love God. And we ought love each other. Can Christ join the church?